Grace and peace. Welcome to the Congregational Church of Middlebury, United Church of Christ. No matter who you are or where you are on this journey, you are welcome here. Before our service continues, I want to thank Ronnie Romano for sharing his music with us this morning. I also want to thank the deacons and the Franklins for helping to make possible this afternoon's first outdoor worship service of the fall. As many of you know, our congregation has a strong commitment to crop walk and to the work of church world service. It won't surprise you to hear that Crop Walk 2020 is going to look different, but it is happening. If you're interested, Patty Hallam would be delighted to give you an envelope for collecting your sponsor's support. And then to participate, you will simply take your own walk for Crop sometime between September 28th and October 4th. Lastly, I'm happy to say that we plan to welcome new members into our church on the second Sunday of November. We hope to be able to do this at our final in-person outdoor worship service of the fall. Now, in advance of that, on Wednesday, October 7th, there will be an open house via Zoom for any and all who would like to take that step or simply to find out more about this church. You will be hearing more about this in the coming weeks. Thank you, friends. Now, would you please join me in a moment of silent, centering prayer? Amen.
please join me in the call to worship. Your day begins when you open your eyes, though you have done little to open them. Your day begins when you give thanks for manifold blessings and you begin to turn gratitude into some concrete common good. Your day begins when you forget yourself long enough for God to find you, and when God finds you to lose yourself again in praise. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. With confidence in the redemptive power of love and mercy, let us lay before God that which draws us away from God, away from our neighbor, and away from the divine likeness in which each of us are made. Together, let us pray. Gracious God, this is the day that you have made, but we confess to you the ways which we are mired in the past the what-ifs, the if-onlys, the would-haves, and should-haves. This is the day that you have made, but even now, we are distracted by many things. Our gaze darts away into the shallows of self-interests, while our sisters and brothers cry for justice and the earth melts. God, forgive us. God, help us. In your mercy, lead us past our weak excuses and preoccupation until we answer your generous kindness with genuine care for neighbor and neighborhood. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. God is sheer mercy and grace, not easily angered. The Lord is rich in love. God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve, nor pay us back in full for our wrongs. As high as heaven is over the earth, so strong is the love of God. By grace, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for attending the Ice Cream Social last Sunday. It was such a joy to see you in person. It really made my day, my week. Honestly, it made my month. And I was amazed to see how much you've all grown in the time we've been apart. But I was also delighted to see your inner light still shining so brightly. Thank you again. So today's story in the Bible that we're looking at is a story about the Israelites in the desert with Moses. And they've been traveling for a really long time. And they're out of food, so they're hungry. Do you guys ever get hungry? I do. What happens when you get hungry? I get cranky. Just ask my family. It's not a really pretty sight. Well, that's pretty much what happened to the Israelites. They were hungry and they got cranky and they started complaining to Moses. So Moses went and told God, God, your people are hungry, they're cranky, and they're complaining. And God told Moses, I will provide for my people. In the evening, they will have quail for dinner, and in the morning, bread. And that is exactly what God did. God provided for her people. It was a little bit like that story, if you've ever read Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, where food kind of rains down from the sky. Well, quail fell from the sky, so they had that for dinner. And in the morning, they awoke to kind of this fine, flaky substance on the ground. And they really weren't sure what it was. And have you ever encountered food that you weren't sure what it was? Well, that happened to me recently at the co-op. Yeah, I've got a few things here. Do you know what this is called? It's not a potato, although it kind of looks like a potato. Or what about this guy? And have you ever seen one of these? Hmm. Well, sometimes when I encounter things that I don't know what they are, I say, well, what is it? And that's exactly what the Israelites said when they woke up and they saw that fine flaky substance. They said, what is it? But way back when they had they used an old hebrew word manna so that's what they called it they called it manna and we still use the word manna today especially in church we'll say ah oh, manna from heaven and it really means something that's really good and but it's like nourishment from god that's what manna is today. But back then, the word manna literally just meant, what is it? So they were calling this stuff on the ground manna, but it didn't mean what it means today. It just meant, what is it? Because they didn't know. And so they asked Moses, well, what is it? And Moses answered them. He said, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Well, it wasn't this kind of bread. It didn't look like this. Remember, it was fine, flaky stuff, almost looked like frost on the ground. But sometimes the word bread, when we're using it in church, can refer to other things. It can symbolize um, what God is providing you. 
It's not necessarily bread. It's just what God is giving you, what you need. So you see, God's people were hungry and God provided for them, just like God provides for us. She makes sure that we have enough of what we need, whether it's food or something else. And God helps us by supplying what we need to live and survive in our own wilderness places during our own challenging times. That's why Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Not give me bread for a month, just give me what I need right now for today. Because remember, it's not really about the bread, it's about what you need, and everyone might need something different for the day. What do you need today? Before we join together in a prayer, I bet there are a few of you out there wondering, what were those things Jennifer showed us? Well, let's take a look at them. I learned some new things yesterday. So this little guy is actually called a Jerusalem artichoke. I've never had one. Maybe you have. This is called a kohlrabi. Kohlrabi. And this interesting one is a celeriac. It smells a little bit like celery, but it certainly doesn't look like celery. Now, I don't really know how I'm gonna prepare them or what I'll make them with because I haven't used them before. But I'll look up some recipes because trying new things is fun. Will you please join me in a, pr in a prayer? Dear Creator, we thank you for all that you have provided us here on earth. May we have faith in the knowledge that you are with us and providing for us. Help us to be grateful for our daily bread. Remind us to look for the manna in our lives that you have sent us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I hope you have a great day. The scripture lesson this morning is from the book of Exodus, from that part of the book where the people are wandering in the wilderness and they're discovering that things are not all that good out in the wilderness. This used to be called the murmuring tradition, although the verb used here is complaining because the people are feeling both seditious and mutinous. Listen for the word of God. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. And that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we? that you complain against us. And Moses said, when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, draw near to the Lord 
for he, he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness and the glory of the Lord appeared in, in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. May God bless this reading to our understanding. Would you please pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Tonight's forecast calls for a low temperature of 32 degrees. That's a bit aggressive for the last Sunday night of summer. So let me counter with a midsummer story from the vault. I'm five or six years old. I'm with my family at my grandparents' cottage near the Cape Cod Canal for the weekend. If that cottage were in Vermont, you would call it a camp. My grandfather and his brother built it in the 50s, and it's just right, right down to the screen door that goes whap when it shuts. So on Saturday, the sun comes up over Buzzards Bay, and I wake up. My brother Jeff is still sleeping. I think everyone in the house is still sleeping. And I lie there for a while, increasingly aware of just how much sand is in my bed. It's a little much, even for me. So I get up and I shuffle into the one room where everything happens. And there on the table, I see them, but I can hardly believe them. Two bright, beautiful boxes of donuts. And these are not just any donuts. They are called Dunkin' Donuts. We don't have them yet back home in the Farmington Valley, which makes them taste better, of course. And no, I don't scarf down 24 donuts that morning. But in the quiet of that new day, I peel back the strip of masking tape, I open a box, and yeah, I had, I had one or two or, or whatever. I mean, donuts go bad if you let them sit out too long. So I do my part and I am the happiest boy on Buzzards Bay. And you know what happened the next day, Sunday morning? Sun comes up, I get up, I've got the place to myself. I walk into the one room where everything happens and I see them, two new boxes of donuts. I'm five years old, this is a miracle. We drive back to Connecticut later that day and, and the whole way home, I'm wondering if donuts are going to be on that cottage table the next morning. It's a mystery. And it remains a mystery until the following summer when I, when I catch my grandfather dropping off boxes of donuts early in the morning. This was his signature move. Get up really early, get some donuts, bring them back to the cottage, and then play 18 holes of golf. Very sensible. 
and loving. I mean, those sweet treats were a gift of love to a cottage of kids. A gift of love like manna is. Manna is a gift from God to desert pilgrims who can get as hungry and grumpy as the rest of us. The Israelites wake up hungry one morning and see something bright and beautiful all around them. They take a closer look. They taste it. They look at each other. What is this? That's what manna means. What is this? And apparently the Israelites do not feel the need to rebrand manna past the boundary lines of today's reading is this telling sentence. The Israelites ate manna for 40 years until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. So basically, they eat something called, what is this, for 40 years. That's pretty funny. I mean, for the Bible. Anyway, here's the important part. 40 years is how long it takes the Israelites to get to the land of milk and honey. And as the story's told, there isn't much milk or honey along the way. It's manna every morning. What's for breakfast? Manna. How about tomorrow? Manna. The next day? Right. Manna's what keeps a community of people alive in a desert for 40 years. What is it? It's life-saving, that's what it is. And yes, botanically speaking, manna may also be the white drops found on the stems of an unpronounceable shrub in the desert of the Middle East. If so, those, those drops are the digestive byproduct, right, of insects that feed on the plant's sap, also called honeydew. The secretion formed at night is loaded with sugar and the sweet liquid hardens in the form of white granules. For the record, I don't see the need to choose between a life-giving gift from Creator God and a natural sugary treat found in the fierce landscape of the Sinai Peninsula. That feels like a both and to me. Manna is bread from heaven, and manna is real earthly food. <clears throat> manna is also a spiritual growth opportunity for the Israelites. Because like donuts, manna does not keep well. So God tells Moses, who tells the people, just gather enough for today and tomorrow, do the same. In other words, this is a story about amazing grace that saves the day that we're in right now. It's also a story about a community of people who are learning to trust, to trust that by the grace of God, there will be enough tomorrow. And it's clear that Jesus is dialed into this. He teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread, not give us this day a week's worth of bread. This strikes me as an antidote to anxious grabbiness and to the fear of scarcity and to hoard mentality. It's also an important reminder to anyone who's wondering if our democracy will make it through the current presidency, and if life on earth has a bright, beautiful future, and how you will find the strength and wisdom to carry on through these COVID days. Because the good news is that God equips us to keep going today, today. As Nadia Boltz Weber says, 
God does not give you more than your community can handle. Which reminds me, a couple nights ago, I got wonderfully lost looking at dozens and dozens of paintings of the manna story. And for all their differences, they had this in common. The people are gathering manna together. More often than not, it looks like they're piling up the holy bread for community use. These altar pieces, these stained glass windows, these master paintings point to manna gathering as a collective art. I looked long and I did not see one time a manna selfie. Manna moments may be deeply, deeply personal, but they are not meant to be private. God's grace is to be shared freely for the good of all today. That's why we're here. To share with one another from God's abundant love. Like a grandfather's delivery to a cottage of kids, like heaven-sent bread, freshly given every morning. Thanks be to God. Amen. As it is written in 2 Corinthians, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. The one who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Friends, responding to God's bountiful gifts to us, we have the opportunity now and always to share out of our abundance. Whatever you give, your time, your talent, your treasure, Whatever you give, big or small, we are grateful. And we truly believe that it does praise God. Thank you.
As we enter into our prayer this morning, let us take a moment of silence to quiet our hearts and minds. O oh God, like the Israelites in the wilderness, we too have known your love and experienced your care and provision. You call us to extend your love to the world around us, to care for others as deeply as we care for ourselves. And so we bring the needs of our world and our gratitude for the world before you now. We give you thanks for the beauty of the changing seasons, for the dedication of teachers and students alike in these challenging times, for the service of healthcare workers, grocery store employees, gas station attendants and truck drivers, for the courage of activists and modern prophets who speak up against injustice for the commitment of firefighters in California, Oregon, and Washington, and those affected by the loss of life and property due to the wildfires. We pray for those who do not have what they need in order to survive, those without enough food to eat or shelter to keep them warm, those without employment or enough money to pay their bills, those without access to medical care or medicine to keep them healthy. We pray for those struggling physically, who are battling life-threatening disease or injury, who are living with chronic pain or illness, who are coping with Alzheimer's or facing death this day. And O oh God, we remember and mourn the passing of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the greatest modern champion of justice for women's rights and human rights. We give you thanks, Holy One, for her life, her legacy, her commitment to equality up to the very end. Surround her family with love at this time and surround us those of us who fear what will come next. May Ruth Bader Ginsburg life empower us all to build a world in which justice rolls down like waters, an ever flowing stream. And in the midst of Ruth Bader Ginsburg passing, we remember our Jewish brothers and sisters as they celebrate this new year, Rosh Hashanah, this weekend. May their new year be good and sweet. And may all of us be committed to standing in solidarity with the Jewish community as they face ever more acts of anti-Semitism. God of the first and last and all those in between, your grace reaches out to all of us. You call us all to live as citizens of heaven, to work together with one mind and one purpose, to reach out in love to those in need. Strengthen us so that we might live in a manner worthy of the good news that we have received, offering our lives to the building up of the kingdom, where there is grace enough for all. In the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray with Christians of all times and all places. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
God bless you and keep you. God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and grant you peace. Let us go now to love and serve our God and neighbor. Amen.